for a few moments, and then measure that by that same eternal passage. So now this and this is this is having to do with the spirit, the proclamation of the truth, and the proclamation. You and you all know, okay, this is one of my favorite passages, most intriguing passages in the, in the scriptures, because um, when the Lord in Luke 16 talked about the rich man and Lazarus, there were things displayed to us there that we see not this clearly anywhere else. So I want to read this for you and then recap very quickly some uh, issues of time especially since this is the last renewal of this millennium. We're done. You realize that you thought about this, haven't you? Okay. And it is. This is, this is the last renewal of the millennium. There's a lot of ends. Uh, little Janie and I were talking about this. We saw the last 4th of July of the millennium, all of these things, see, winding down. But these are issues, these are little benchmarks, okay? We call these uh, milestones as we go by. First, let me read to you the importance, or the important passage out of Luke 16, and then I want to run something by you, and we're going to come back to this. There's a, there's a point to be made here. There's significant observations for us to make. Read with me, if you will, Luke 16, starting in verse 19. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's a unique passage in all of Scripture. Now, tolerate me for a moment. I, I, I won't go too far back. Let me, I, I want to go this far, and we're going to take a walk now for a few moments. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus Christ, in the fullness of time, came into the world, born of a woman. About the same time, the Han Dynasty was ruling in China. Imperial Rome was reigning and expanding around the globe. About 30 years, maybe 33 years later, Jesus was rejected by his own people and he was summarily executed in a unique way. He was crucified. 
not much after that, Masada, a mountaintop fortress in the Judean desert, was, reno was uh, renovi renovated by Herod the Great between 37 and 31 BC, and in AD 66, a Jewish sect known as the Zealots seized the fortress, and after a long siege, 15,000 Roman soldiers were on the verge of taking Masada from the thousand remaining Jewish defenders. To avoid capture, almost all the zealots kill themselves. The use of the word zealot is now used to refer to an extremist, and it comes from those doomed defenders. At the same time, Jerusalem was destroyed. In AD 79, and we were moving pretty quick here. This is already 80 years we've covered. The days of the Roman splendor, the town of Pompeii in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius was a, was a favorite place for the wealthy. Well, then Vesuvius erupted and buried the entire town. I wasn't aware of this, but that town stayed buried till 1748 when they discovered the ruins of it. It was so, so devastated. A few years after this, John, on the Isle of Patmos received a revelation. By the way, that was the closing revelation of the book. Just a few years later, I want you to look at, look at the things that are happening here. The implications to us today and to the, the occurrences, the people around about them, as, we, as, as we're flying through here right now, okay? We're gonna go really fast. In 105, the Chinese invented paper. You know, we've been using scrolls made it out of beet cane and papyrus and things. Well, they actually invented paper, some way to make paper. They were writing things down. That was only in 105. At the same time, the Mayan civilizations were flourishing in Central America. You know, look at the world. Look at the flavor of the world. And the nomads had begun the early disruption of the Roman Empire. Jump ahead another century, in 220 A.D., they begin uh, wearing silk, made from silkworms. And the Chinese carried silk by camel caravan, caravans across the Gobi Desert to oases and shipping ports around, and they shipped it around the world. In 271, we're moving pretty fast now, the Chinese mathematicians, mathematicians actually created a simple compass that they could begin to use. The Europeans, the Anglos, didn't get a hold of this till almost uh, 12 centuries later. At this time, the Byzantine Empire is founded. Things are happening. We're moving right along. Now we're in the 300s. Christian chants became an increasingly common form of religious expression while they were singing, uh, singing uh, together. Some of the music was later cataloged by Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, and thus became known the Ambrosian chants. Many of you have heard of this. And they were one of the earliest forms of Western music. In 387, Augustine was born and was converted to Christianity. After his conversion, he became one of the great leaders of the Christian world at that time. At that time, the formation of the Japanese state was coming together and the Dark Ages and feudalism was beginning its reign across Europe. In 570, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and we're a long way away from the beginning here now, half a millennium. In 570, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was born in Mecca. In, 622, in September of 622, Muhammad fled the city because he was scorned by the citizens of Mecca and went to Yarib, which is now Medina. Those who followed and assisted him during his flight became leaders in the Islamic movement of that time. Let's bolt ahead a couple more centuries. In 800, Charlemagne, king of France, was crowned emperor of the, by the Romans, of the Romans by Pope Leo III on Christmas Day in 800 A.D. Bolt ahead two more centuries. In the year 1000, or right there somewhere, Iceland explorer Leif Erikson is believed to have been one of the first Europeans to set foot on North America. Evidently, it was in Canada somewhere on the Atlantic coast. And also during the 10th century, 
a newly uh, discovered uh, and very deadly weapon found its way into the European arsenal. The crossbow, which was capable of firing a missile about a thousand feet and even piercing chain mail mounted on a stock of wood and the bow made of metal, it was so deadly it was outlawed by the Catholics, at least for use against Christians, in the Lantern Council of 1139. It was too popular, however, to be banished forever and remained in use well into the 15th century. Jump ahead another hundred years. Richard the Lionheart, hearted, um, was born in 1189, King of England, you remember him. He set forth on a third crusade. The crusaders by this time were already in the Holy Lands. 1189. Here's a, another interesting, and these are, these are apocal things that were taking place. And this, this is a sampling, obviously. We're talking about history. In 1274 and 81, the Mongols attacked and nearly overwhelmed Japan. Rebuffed by their first attempt, they returned in 1281 with a force of 140,000 men, the largest naval exposition, expedition before modern times. The Mongols clung to several beachheads for two months, before fortune came to the aid of the Japanese. A typhoon destroyed much of the Mongol fleet. Ashore, the dispirit invaders fell to, de to defeat. Only about half of the huge Mongol army returned safely to the mainland. The Japanese believed that Providence had sent a kamikaze, the Japanese word for divine wind, to their assistance. Hundreds of years later, Hard pressed in World War II, the term was used again. Jump ahead to 1300. Now, the Aztec Empire is beginning to reign in Mexico. Also, this is the time that the shoguns, those were military leaders in Japan, began to appear. These are, these are all firsts. And the Ming Dynasty rises to prominence in China. 1431, May 30th, Joan of Arc, the Maid of Orleans, is burned at the stake. 1452, Leonardo da Vinci, now we're, we're, we've come a millennium and a half almost already, is born. 1455, the Gutenberg Bible, the first ever printed with metal type, is completed by Johann Gutenberg, who lived from 1400 to 1468. In 1440, the Incan Empire is now thriving and extending across the entire Andean region in, in Central America. This is big stuff. 1492, Columbus discovered, hey, look over there, America. And the Protestant Reformation began right about that time, too, 1500. 1607, we're already in Jamestown, United States. The English established the first colony there. 1648, something you've all seen before, the Taj Mahal is built in India, completed in 1648, built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. He reigned from 1628 to 58 in honor of his favorite wife who passed away. It was, it was combined... Uh, Indian and Persian architectural styles, characteristics of a Mughal arch architecture is called. Surrounded by four spires and topped by an 80-foot dome, an oblong reflecting pool enhances its beauty. And of the 10,000 workers who worked on that, the, uh, the ruler, after they were finished to ensure that they would build nothing prettier, removed all their hands. Frederick Handel, George Frederick Handel, was born in 1658, one of the best composers of the late Baroque period. He's the one that wrote The Messiah. Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685, we're moving forward. 1692, witchcraft trials are going on in Salem, Massachusetts. Many were burned there. 1729, Catherine the Great of Russia was born. As Empress, Catherine presided over the Russian expansion into the Baltic region. The whole world is changing. Ukraine, Poland, the Near East. 1756, Mozart is born. 
in Austria. 1769, James Watt builds the first good steam engine. 1776, the Continental Congress voted in favor of separation. The Declaration of Independence was written. In 1800, right at 1800, both the American and French revolutions are taking place. The Napoleonic Wars in France. 1830, we're getting close now. Slow down here. The first real railroad opened in Liverpool and Manchester in England. They ran that, ran that route also in the U.S. 1830 was the first. Uh, the Carolina Central Canal Railroad was opened then. The Latin American revolutions began and statehood for those company, countries began for the first time. They were all underway. 1838, the Cherokee Indians were resettled, what came to be known as the Trail of Tears. 1859, a big year, Charles Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of the Species. 61, the great American Civil War began. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 65. In 1903, two brothers, Wilbur, Wilbur and Orville Wright, discovered how to remain aloft in a heavier-than-aircraft. In 1908, Henry Ford changed the world on four wheels. In 1945, a gentleman said, I wonder if we're not monkeying around with things that are none of our business. And early that morning, Hiroshima went up in a cloud of thermal nuclear reaction. 1946, the ENAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania was the first fully digital computer. Had over 18,000 vacuum tubes and less power than a handheld calculator. In 1969, we were on the moon. Then there were personal computers. Then we discovered AIDS. The Soviet Union fell apart. The ozone layer had a hole in it. The Internet, Tiananmen Square, the Hubble Telescope, etc., etc. Full circle, brethren. After all of this, after all of these things, and this has to be some pinhead nothing in essence of the number of things that's taken place. Where are the amendments to the scripture? What changes? What changes have had to be written? Where was the spirit in the proclamation of the necessary truth deficient? He wasn't. In all of this time, the word of God has remained true and righteous. Amen. In all, through all of these things, now, now understand, do you, you read about, all, catch these wars, the revolutions, how many people lived and died within the clutches of these things? horribly. And yet, yet I can say to you tonight that all of these whose affections were set on things above are in Abraham's bosom, just like the beggar, just like Lazarus tonight. And all of those who refused this word are just like the rich man, mourning about the torments of this flame. In, in wondering how exactly to, to, to look at this, and what I wanted to talk about was the Spirit's employment of the Scripture as, as he goes, as we go through the Scriptures, as we look at examples, it occurred to me that our daily walk is nothing to the saints, is an exact, it's an exemplification of the Spirit's employment of the scripture to us. We have believed and therefore we have, we have spoken. We have believed and therefore we have lived as unto him. Now I want to preface at this point, I want to preface uh, the rest of it similarly to what Jess said. As the spirit moves and he is, a, he is alive in us and there, were, there will be things that occur to you probably already have. As, as we've gone through this. Now this, this is something that I was thinking about yesterday and the more that I look at this, the, the more current all of these events really are. And uh, 
I, I want you anyhow, all you speakers, all of you brethren that have listened here, and have something you'd like to add. Now, this is a discussion time where we're going through this. But as, the, as we do, I want you to please feel free. The microphones are open here, and uh, we'll all benefit by sharing in the, in the faith of each one of us. Look at the importance. Let's go back to eternity again now. Look at the importance of what Abraham was, was dis describing there. As, as Jesus pulls this curtain back, he talks about the great gulf that is fixed. And it amazes me, and I am convinced, because the end is not yet, I am convinced that the rich man today is saying, what about my brothers and every other boogeyman in his, that he, that in this world, that he, the flesh that he didn't crucify, all of those things are, are, are part of him now. All of those things. Let he that is filthy be filthy still. Let he that is holy be holy still. That, 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 that line of thought is, is um, in my understanding, and I'm convinced of this again, that there, there is nothing there that is comforting the rich man tonight at all. He is in torments. That is a picture of what hell is like. That's, and obviously, we have been saved from that through Jesus Christ. This is a good picture of that. He, why would he be comforted? He saw Abraham. Or he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, where he was not. First off, he saw them, and they're far off. They're across some sort of impassable gulf, and he's comforted in, in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man's in torments. There is. Obviously, there's not one hope here for him. We can't go over there. You can't come over here. The next thing that may have given him some hope was to think about his brothers. I don't want him to come here. And there's something else that kind of stands out to me, too. In this, in this depiction, in this picture, again, this is one Christ give, gave, um, and I think we do well to look, not to look at this as a parable because he names people here. And he doesn't say, he spake a parable like he does everywhere else. It's not like that here. Um, the, the gentleman's thought that we have, I've got five brothers. There's some potential comfort. If, I, if they don't come here, I could save them from that. Tonight, I think he's still grieving over those five brothers. You notice in the passage that he's alone. He's not there with all of his friends the contemporary thinking, at least I'll be with all my friends. No, he didn't have comfort of anything. And methinks this is just the beginning. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them, he said. Yeah, I don't want them to come here. And then he argues with Abraham. No, 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 Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. There, see... Even here, he's got that wrong view of what miracles do, what miracles are for. If your heart is not changed, this, this smoke and mirrors and sparkle of, this, of, of the unordinary will not change your heart later. It doesn't. They don't last. Here, uh, remember when uh, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth. Later on, the Jews were conspiring on how they could kill Lazarus again, and kill Jesus too to get him out of the way. That didn't. They weren't impressed. They weren't impressed by that. How could they not be impressed by that? And he says to his own people there, "Believe me for the very work's sake." And he said unto them, "If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded." I like that. I mean, that's a. It's precise. Neither will they be persuaded. Persuaded of what? of heavenly things, of avoiding this thing? Not necessarily. It's the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. It's what he spoke by Moses and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. What the Spirit said was precise. It was precise then. It was precise through all the accounting of time of the two millennia that we just skipped through in eight minutes. And it's true tonight. One of the, uh, every, every verse just about that we go through in passage here now, as, as I would like to exemplify what we're talking about in the uh, 
uh, the, the, the Spirit's use of the Scripture here, the employment, he has any, and I, I'm asking this as a question right now, I didn't find and I looked for some kind of a number, how much of the New Covenant writings, the, what we call the New Testament, obviously the New Testament where he says he'll write the law in our hearts, but in the, in the last uh, uh, 27 books there of the Bible, how much of that is, quote, in percent of all the Old Covenant writings out of the Old Scriptures? It's a big number. It's really big. And as for absolutely unique thoughts in the New Covenant, or in, the, in the New Writings, we may see some flavors in, in Revelation of, of, of some pictures there that we haven't seen before, but the truth is still the same. The tenor of Scripture from Genesis on is, you may bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. And that'll be done. So that's the spirit as he goes on in Christ. Quote, and I, we've got several of these we'll look at in just a moment. But Christ and uh, even, even the apostles, even the fishermen. I would like to, and this is another one of my favorite texts, and it's been used about how many speakers have we had that many times? In Acts chapter 2, remember when Peter there starts referring to Joel again. And he, I can see him, he's like some of the speakers we've had up here, jumping up and down and excited about this because it's true. This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. They're not drunk. They're not drunk. It'll come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. They were... He, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. He didn't make that up. This, not, this was not just something that matched something in the Old Testament. It wasn't just that. This was the application of that text to Peter's heart and mind to what was happening there. This is the same way it works with us. We know a lot of data. We, we do. But it's the Spirit of God within you that mobilizes this for you, that makes it work. We, Brother Bob and I said this, uh, he and I have a, a kinship here. We didn't just get smart. That's not what it is. It's being sensitive to the Spirit, sensitive to the will of God, and desires to be conformed to that image. Bless his heart. See, I understand, Peter. I, I know what it's like to be like that. Because, I, because I, I kind of am. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here this was all opening up to him. And the implications. And he goes on to say, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. And there's no ambiguity to it at all. A man approved of God among you by, we talked about this, by those miracles and signs and wonders, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. I know you know. You were there. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken. And by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It is not. And he goes on speaking about David. And uh, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. He brought it home to their hearts again. Now when they heard this, now this is the answer of an honest and good heart before God. They were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That again is, that's the correct reaction. That's how it should be when your Brother Al was talking about being convicted. The the correct response to conviction is 
what shall I do? It's to fall down before him. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, and I'll bet they were good, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's where we're at right now. Every one of us are in process of saving ourselves from this untoward generation. Go to Bill. Well, you just stirred up a whole pot in my mind. Uh oh. That's great stuff. <clears throat> Regarding all of these movements of history mm -hmm. and how they've not daunted neither the scripture nor the church, it should not be a surprise, as God told Daniel, that in one day, you know, he would raise up a kingdom and the gates of hell shall not prevail against that kingdom I don't care who it is I don't care through what war through what movement through what civilization even Mr. Gates and his kingdom three of the four most wealthiest men who have ever lived on the face of the earth work for Microsoft and they can't do it it is not a surprise you know, we look at these things and they're grand on the earthly scale, but, uh, but it's just nothing. And you see this, and that's quite impressive. I like the way you put that together. But uh, I don't know how long we're going to be able to add to our history here of these things, but they're just uh -huh. like futile attempts. They're just little sparks that come up and they're just doused. Because, and it'll continue to happen like that, and we know that. Mm -hmm. But boy, that's a whole mess of things to think about. The point, the point, I think, well taken, again, is what the scripture, the scriptures that have been delivered to us and so well protected through the ages are absolute. They're complete. They're flawless. I mean, you can count, you can read, and you can, you can count, you can believe what's written there. Yes? Perhaps an older source than Abraham. We don't know uh, the source of these or, or the, the age of these writings. But our brother Job said in chapter 12, with him are wisdom and might. To him belong counsel and understanding. Behold, he tears down and it cannot be, be, be rebuilt. He imprisons a man and there can be no release. Behold, he restrains the waters and they dry up. He sends them out and they inundate the earth. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. He makes counselors walk barefoot, makes fools of judges. He loosens the bonds of kings and binds their loins with a girdle. He makes priests walk barefoot and overthrows the secure ones. He, derived, he deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on nobles and loosens the belt of the strong. He reveals mysteries from the darkness and brings the deep darkness into light. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. He deprives the, of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people, makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness with no light. He makes them stagger like a drunken man. Brethren, I would remind you that those are the words of a man with no Bible. <laughs> with no written revelation who had great insight into everlasting things into things that remain true because they were true before they were written down this is something I preached for years before this dawned on me that this, this truth that we have in this volume is true not because it's written but it's written because it's true Amen. and that's why we rejoice and Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, I spoke a little bit, I believe it was the last evening, regard, I think it was last yesterday with Jess, regarding these spatial things having to do with interstellar space and some of the measurements and how that, I wanted, I wanted to reiterate this just, just to the point, 
wasn't lost in those things. I am convinced that every word right here, every word written, every passage, every thought, every nuance has the same mathematical, I, and I use that, I'm speaking as a man here, mathematical formula behind them in that when he just, when he talks about these things just in passing, we look at them and they're, un, they're, they're, they're incomprehensible. They're so, they're big. They're big. The, uh, they're big. It's, it's a massive. It's, 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 it's unthinkable, the scale. And yet he just says, hey, I created the stars also, I call them by name. And it goes on with something else. That every passage right here is of the same magnitude. Amen. He loved us and gave himself for us. Yes. What does that mean? That means that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. And that's a whole bunch of words put together. Amen. Brother Dean. message of scripture has been and always has been and it's remained the same until this day and that is to save yourself from this untoward generation now it's it's for each man to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling so if that's the case uh, you know there's a lot of voices that, that that say here here come and seek me here you know it's 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 everywhere all around us so, but we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and there's and it has been outlined here this morning uh, real well, I, I thought. I, I love uh, Brother Jason's message and the work of the Holy Spirit in subduing the flesh because the Holy Spirit, this is doable. It's, you know, if you, if, you, if you try to do it, and as he pointed out very clearly, if you try to do it in any other way than by the Spirit subduing the flesh, you, you won't, you're not a conqueror. You won't have any success. But if, if you walk in the Spirit, as another message, and then you produce the fruits of the Spirit, which is another This is all very, very clearly outlined in Scripture. And uh, the problem is that, that we don't quite understand how to do this. Well, there's some very practical ways of doing it, and, they're, and walking in the Spirit, and we're, each one are individuals, there are different ways we do it, of course. But I, I thought maybe I, I could tell you how I really had some success in doing this. I don't have a 100% success, but I have, a, I'm, I have success when I do it. And I, I, I started memorizing scripture. Not memorizing scripture, just memorize scripture. Memorizing scripture to get it in my heart. That's, what, that's where it has to, it has to be in your heart. So you memorize scripture, you get it in your heart. And you, then, you got it in your heart, you muse upon it, you think upon it, you, you say, you, you think to yourself, why did the writers of the scripture, why did they say this just a certain mm -hmm. way? Exactly. And then you think about that. My wife always says to me, she says, um, the problem with you, you're always thinking. And I said, <laughs> the problem with me, I don't think enough. <laughs> because this is where, this is where uh, you have victory. Is, is thinking and musing upon the Word of God. You cannot sin while you're, while you're thinking on the Word of God and musing on the Word of God. You just, it, it, it's impossible. And you'll find that to be the case. The problem is keeping your mind on the Word of God and upon, upon the things of God and upon the truth. And, and I memorized um, out of King James and uh, Brother Jason pointed out that, that uh, uh, this subduing of the flesh, you, 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 uh, and as you think about the Word of God, and he pointed out that in some other versions that uh, the Word of God may not, um, uh, they're not precisely the same. But if you memorize the King James, you get the sense, and if you muse on it, 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 it people read it without thinking, Thinking upon, and, and Brother Fred used to call it ruminating. Mm -hmm. Ruminate the Word of God. And, and if you think on it, and uh, 
you meditate on, on the Word of God, you, you get the sense of the Word. It, it, it's not impossible in, the, in a King James Version. There's a big push today that you go to the uh, different versions that, that are clearer. Well, the King James is pretty clear to me. It's just that it kind of kind of shook the foundations that throughout which I had been used to, and that was the flesh. And of course, that needed to be separated and taken away. And uh, but but uh, I remember uh, I gave myself I give myself assignments, and the assignment was to memorize the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing. And I I couldn't I I had a <laughs> excited me and and to know that I was a conqueror that I uh, I was more than a conqueror in Christ and, and what what I was in Christ that um, it's first you have to die you have to realize your your flesh is it's not profitable at all in the kingdom of God and that you, you you've got to die and uh, as brother Tim pointed out so well this morning that you you must die and that that's a prerequisite you must die um, as uh, Jason mentioned this morning about and every time anyone talks about eternal security I think of this incident that happened in my life is my wife's sister's granddaughter uh, they called up here they lived down in the southern part of Illinois and they called up here and said um, that uh, Sherry the, the grand, her granddaughter had gotten in trouble at the church they attended and um, they wanted to talk to Uncle Dean so I talked to her and said uh, well, Sherry, the, the, the teacher in the youth group, was teaching her and said, uh, you were so eternally secure that I could go out and kill a hundred people and I would be still eternally secure in Christ. And uh, Sherry just spoke up and said, that's a lie. And they took her before the, the, uh, the deacons of the church and... Uh, told her to go back and apologize. Share, and they said to me, we haven't went back and apologized yet. What, what should we do? I said, shake off the dust of your feet and get out of there. And uh, I said, she need not apologize because I consider that if someone said that in my presence, I would probably do the same thing. Because I consider that the Holy Spirit within her just, you know, that's a lie. And it is a lie. And I was thinking, as Brother Jason was speaking here, that uh, she said uh, we could go out and kill, she could go out and kill a hundred men, but she missed the point. There's one man, not only, you, but there's one man you must kill, and that's your old nature. And that that there is a killing to take place, it's a death to take place, but you must slay that old nature. We're as, as pointed out, we're participants in the gospel. And our role now and our uh, responsibility is to slay the old man, to keep the old man on the cross. It's dying, it's in his death throes. Well, let's keep, it, let's keep up the aggression against, it, against the old man. That's what we must do. If we don't, if we don't uh, keep the, the flesh in subjection, we'll die eternally. Separation, eternal separation from God. Well, I would rather die the death of the flesh now the problem I have a problem with it and I and I and I have to keep up keep up the pressure against the flesh that's why I like the the, the, the uh, fellowship of brother I I cherish it I really cherish it I come to to the assembly and, and, and the people might get a little tired of me talking but I like to express myself when, when you have the word in you it has to find expression and that's the truth that's true. You, you it, the, the, and it, we don't all express 
express it in the same way. My wife would be mortified to stand before people and talk. She couldn't talk. She couldn't express hers. But she expresses it in her life and her and the and the things she does and the, and, the, mm -hmm. and 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 so there's there are different ways that people express themselves. But the thing is that the word of God within you finds expression. Amen. And uh, I love to the assembly of the brethren and I love to hear them express themselves. I love to glean from them and their view of and as Brother Mike said we we, had, we shared this. I think this is the, the, the saints throughout the ages we get a we'll get a uh, as we gather together gather in glory we'll get a full picture of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get a partial picture of it now from different one of the brethren as we share with one another. And that, that is exciting. It's really thrilling to me. And I love to meet with uh, brethren of like precious faith. Mm -hmm. And this, this week has been an exception, exceptional week. We, we've been praying for, for you, brethren. Uh, Brother Al and, and, uh, and I, I, I stop by the hardware store to see him quite often because it's, it, we, we, we kind of stir ourselves up in, in, the, in this running the race. And, Looking at it, we look unto Jesus and we share these things of God with one another. And uh, we've been praying for for um, the, uh, uh, the re the renewal here on the Holy Spirit and each subject and each each one that ministers. And, and I think the anticipation to hear uh, what was going to be uh, spoken here this week has really been a, uh, an exciting thing to me. But but. We are, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And I, I just wanted to point that out. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. I'm not touching it. The, brother Given. Please stand here. I wanted to comment a little bit on what brother Dan said there about the, uh, the history that occurred in the world. That, Normally, if you had a valuable, valuable seed that you were going to plant, you'd, you'd be very particular about where you planted it, and maybe in an isolated area of some sort. But the Lord planted his word. See, the word, the seed of the kingdom is the word. N not the tree. The seed is the word. And he planted it in the middle of all this revolutionary historical occurrences. It was planted in the middle of middle of all of that, and it it, it outstripped everything else. See that you didn't want to miss. It. He was showing that there was dramatic change going on, except in the seed. <laughs> it didn't change, and uh, it never had been polluted. The when John received the revelation, come home to me here sometime a few a little while back. How how significant it was that it says that. God gave it to Jesus, and Jesus gave it to an angel, and the angel gave it to John, and John gave it to us. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't diluted, one, one diluted, diluted one bit. And then he gave it to John in exile, <laughs> oppressed by a government amidst a bunch of dead churches. That's just where he gave it, there. <laughs> So you see, there's no excuse for anyone not getting hold of the Word of God, is there? There's no excuse of it, no excuse for it at all. And Paul, he, Paul lives when Nero is ruling. He doesn't even mention his name. He never. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Socrates and some of these guys lived during the prophecy. Hey, they never, they never, you'd have never known they lived if all you knew was the Bible. He didn't even recognize them as valid. Huh? The great mathematicians and the great medicinal people and the great medical people, they were all born back there contemporary with those old prophets. You see, they weren't important because they didn't have something that's going to last. Amen. So I thank God. That's a good perspective, Amen. Brother Dan. In the midst of change, here's the eternal seed. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Here, okay, let's do this thing again with, he created the stars also. Now listen, now this, here, this, this, because this hurts my heart, okay, this, this is one that'll hurt. Nevertheless, when the Lord comes, shall he find faith in the earth? Created the stars also. 
That is just as deadly serious as it sounds. That is a question that every man must ask himself. No, that's not, that's real, that's it, that's it. When he comes and we say by thy grace, Father, yes, yes, we will. You'll find faith, it'll be mine. That's what we all say. We have to. But that's, that's another one of those statements, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that all of this is extreme understatement. Just, yes, just, a, just a matter of fact. It's laid out there in absolute clarity and truth. It's there before us. The scriptures use this. Now, here's another one. Let me, let's go to the other extreme here. Heirs of God. Let's do, the, let's do this. I, and I enjoy this. Let's do this as if we were putting together the chart here, the distribution of the wealth. God, heirs of God, down here, joint heirs with Christ. Where to now? That's it. That's it? You mean we're joint heirs with Christ? That's what he says. Created the stars also. Same thing. I have not seen. For the dim. They have Moses and the prophets. Yes. Amen. Neither will they believe though one rose from the dead. So, I mean, the Moses and the prophets, that's the power of God into salvation. Amen. That's the gospel. A miracle can't produce faith. Not lasting faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the only thing that can generate faith. So we ought to have confidence in it. It's that Amen. seed that's sown in the soil. You know that the fruit that's born up, we're getting agriculture lesson today. <laughs> but the fruit that is born up, all of the life comes from the seed. The only thing we provide is the environment in which it can grow. That's all the fruit is in the seed. The life is from the seed. And he said the seed is the word of God. So that word of God will produce fruit in you. Amen. If you let it. Amen. Amen. A good seed, yes. When I, we were hearing about the history there, I, I like to study church history. And, and some thoughts were coming to my mind about some of the great spiritual revivals that have happened throughout the history of the church. Um, Brother Dave, I know, has done some research in this and probably could put me to shame, but I just started gathering my thoughts about what are some common things that happened when there were great spiritual awakenings and revivals going on. Uh, mainly, I'm thinking in our, our country, but there have, been, there have been others. And I came up with nine things that, that were in common with, with spiritual awakenings. And uh, I'll just go down through this real quickly here. But any time there was a revival, you know, we want revival, right? I mean, that's been mentioned. Any time there was a revival, I've noticed that there was always somebody preaching the gospel. Amen. Uh, not just preaching, period, but preaching the gospel. Uh, there's a lot of other messages today, but re when revival has happened, there's always been somebody proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Uh, the second characteristic was that revivals were always unorganized. <laughs> That's true. There, it, it never happened where there was anything organized. I like what Brother Seth said about the guy carrying a bag of truth. All, the devil wants him to organize it, and that'll ruin it. And, well, that's, that is true, but you'll notice any time there was some great revival, you can retrace it back through history there, and, and it was always something that was unorganized. It just kind of happened. Nobody said, let's get together and have a revival today. You know, I, I find it kind of strange that churches plan revival. How do you plan a revival? I'd, I'd like to know. Um, there was always an emphasis on repentance from sin. Now, that's, that's not a popular message. People don't like to be told today that they're sinners, first of all. And they certainly don't like to be told to change or to repent. But that's the message that's needed today, isn't it? And, you know, if, we don't, if you don't repent, you will all likewise perish. And any time anytime there was a revival, there was always people repenting from their sin. Uh, fourthly, 
uh, true revival is always widespread. It's never just located in one congregation. Although that can happen. You know, we don't, there can be congregations that experience revival. We want that to happen. But when we're talking, the kind of revival I'm talking about is widespread throughout the whole body of Christ, interdenominational. Not just the Christian churches or the Baptist churches, the charismatic churches. But true revival is not located just in one area, one town, one county, one state. But, and not just in one group, but, but it's widespread. Uh, fifthly, prayer, fasting, and an emphasis on holiness has always been there before revival started. You can't have revival without, I, I don't think you can have revival without prayer and an emphasis on holiness. And maybe that's why there's not a lot of revival going on today. Number six was that revivals always happen during sinful and difficult times in history. You know, I, I hear a lot of conservative folk complaining a lot, you know, about the times. We, I, I think that we should avoid just complaining all the time about the difficult times and realize that actually difficult times is an excellent opportunity for God. The more difficult the time, usually that's when God really does something powerful. You know, things weren't real great in the world when Jesus was born. So, uh, during sinful, difficult times, and usually, number seven here, unusual leadership. Whenever revivals happened, it was, it was always somebody who was an unusual person. Uh, Charles Finney was a lawyer in, uh, up in New York State, and he began a tremendous revival up there. He wasn't a professional man. He was a weirdo in his generation. John the Baptist was a weirdo. You know, he ate locusts. Um, unusual leadership. Uh, Number eight, unusual places outside the church. You'll notice, who ever heard of Cane Ridge? I mean, Cane Ridge, uh, Cane Ridge, Kentucky, you know, that's, that's not a very important place. You know, if you're going to have a revival, you ought to have it in New York City or Chicago, surely, something. Cane Ridge revival, you know. Unusual places, the wilderness of Judea. You see, that's, that's the principle. God, unusual places outside the organized church. Seems like whenever there was a revival, it always got on somebody's nerves in the organized church. And the final thing here was that uh, whenever there was revival, God's people were meeting together. Yeah. That and see, God's people don't, or the what, people who claim to be the church, we don't meet together very much anymore. You know, we've axed Wednesday nights, we've axed Sunday nights, we meet an hour on Sunday morning. That's about it. Revival can't happen like that. If we don't want revival, that's the best way not to get it, is to just cut down the meeting of the church, see. But when God's people were together, and there was always a movement of unity, there was always unity that was emphasized whenever there was revival. So I just throw this possibility out to you that today, today, that there, could be, there can be real revival like we have seen throughout the history of the church and of the world. And I, I'm optimistic. Amen. I wanted to kind of take a little bit different um, way here, and I want you to know that um, I'm speaking with the Spirit's help, and um, these are not things that I've seen on my own, but things that He has opened up to me. Um, and if there's something that I say that is out of order, please correct me. <laughs> I want to be like a, a Paulus. He was, had the fervent desire to preach to the Lord, and he was corrected and went the right way. So I desire to be right. Um, when Brother Danny was um, talking about Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus, um, it brought up um, a thought in Hebrews. And I'll be reading from Hebrews 10, 19. If you all want to turn there. Um, this is what it says. It says, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the well that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with, with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope 
without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, this is one of my favorite parts, how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit, which it is, of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, which it is drawing near. Praise the Lord. Amen. The reason why I connected that is I was thinking about what the, the rich man had lost and what we have gained through Christ, through Christ dying in his... Um, his resurrection. We have confidence to enter into the holy place. I know you all are, are probably schooled and educated in the old covenant, but the priest was only allowed to go in once a year. And they, they had to tie a rope around him because if he did something wrong, he was dead. And we have that ability through the blood of Christ to be able to enter into the holy place and come to God and get as much as we want whenever we want to because of the blood of Jesus. And we have confidence in doing that. He's our great priest. And I went through Hebrews, and I noticed that. It was very prevalent through the book of Hebrews. It kept saying that Christ is our great priest. He's our great priest. And so I kind of did a little study on that. And I found in Hebrews 6.20 that it says, and this is picking up in the middle of a sentence, for Jesus has entered as a forerunner. And I'll just stop there. He's our forerunner meaning that we are not going down a path that nobody else has gone down. Christ was our forerunner. And that, to me, gives me more confidence to be able to come in and, and fellowship with the Father. With a sincere heart. God works with sincere hearts, with humble hearts and hearts that are right towards Him. He used Christ to be the Savior of the world because Christ had a humble heart and He was willing to do the will of the Father. And... Um, that was something that was encouraging to me. We can draw near with assurance if we have a sincere heart. Hold fast. Mm -hmm. I love that. Hold fast. Stand firm in your faith. In Hebrews 12, 11, Hebrews 11 and 12 are probably one of the, my most favorite chapters out of the whole Bible because it talks about faith, which is our link to the Father. It says, um, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every, not some, every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This salvation is not an easy salvation. It's something that we have to run hard. And um, it's something that you have to finish. I remember Brother Given talking about it. Having a race one time, and people, all, all kinds of people from the town gathering to watch this race. And they started, and the people got up and left. And on the way up, they were talking about the race, the start of the race. Did you see that starter? Did you see how he came out of the starting blocks? But they didn't stay to finish, to see the finish of the race, how they finished the race. That's the most important, how you finish the race. And you stand firm with endurance, and we can do that through Christ. Um, let me go down a little bit further. We have full assurance of faith. Let's see. Having our hearts sprinkled clean. Sprinkled clean with the blood of Christ. We can come before the Father because of that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> From an evil conscience, which we all are guilty of that, evil conscience, a defiled body, not able to come into the presence of the Lord, and our bodies washed pure with water, waters of baptism. Let us hold fast the confession, the confession that we know, we know in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the Lord and He is our Savior and hold on to that. I know there have been times where I have just, just that's the only thing I can hold on to is knowing that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that if everything else were to fall apart, I knew that one thing that he is the Christ Amen. and not wavering it says without wavering don't be cast around like a ship tossed at sea but hold on without wavering because what he has promised is faithful Amen. I love that in 2 Timothy 2.13 it talks about God being faithful even though we are not faithful and that doesn't mean he's faithful to us even though we're not faithful it means that he is faithful in the promises that he has laid down and that's an encouragement to me that we have somebody 
a God that we can worship and go before and be able to know that what he has promised, he will carry out, and he is not a liar. God is not a liar. And this last part of this verse is very, very dear to my soul because of the fellowship back home. I told myself I was going to cry. <laughs> it says, not forsaking our own assembling together. Right. Talking about the saints. Mm -hmm. And when we moved away, I realized what that was. And, and brethren that forsake that are missing out. Mm -hmm. They are missing out on that. We talked about this last night. Why don't we have pews filled? People are missing out. They're missing out on such an encouragement. But we aren't. The people that are here want to be here, and they want to be encouraged, and God will bless you. Because I know he's blessed me Amen. these last three days. So I want to encourage you all to draw near, because the day of Christ is coming. And I want to see all of you there on that day Amen. and spend eternity with you. And I don't want you all to be crying out like the rich man for just a drop of water. I want to see you all there. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's sad. He just about did it for me, but <coughs> I'm thinking it's time that we think, so what? So we go from here. The whole Bible is the story of God's efforts to eliminate sin and restore man to fellowship with himself. Get man back to where God is living in us, and that is having the Holy Spirit saying, so what are we to do? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teach and admonish one another. We've been trying to do that. With psalms and spiritual songs, give expression of gratitude to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, recognize I'm here in the business of Christ, as a representative of Christ, in the name of Christ. Whatever, if, even if you hit the wrong nail with a hammer, Say a good word for Christ. I hear people using the name of God in the church blasphemously. The expression, oh my God, has become every day on the TV and every day in the public and some days in the church. Don't use the name of God for anything but serious recognition of his majesty and his love. So what I'm getting at, we do need to memorize scripture. I don't know why Christian people are so stubborn about ever trying to memorize scripture. People that will memorize the chapters of Masonic work or, or uh, lots of stuff for business, many formulas and so forth, say, I can't memorize. You do remember, and the Lord gave you a memory to you, you'll, be, you'll remember what you're interested in. Many of these passages that men are quoting here are helpful because they're able to blend them together through, from their memories. Many of them, when you read them in the Bible, you don't see their meaning until you memorize them. Mm -hmm. One of the best processes for better interpretation is memorizing. Amen. Now, this is Colossians 3, 16 and 17. At the end of 15, he said, and be ye thankful. And so you call together in one body in peace and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The King James gums it up by adding to that in all wisdom as if that no, that modifies the next. It's teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And the third, sing, express. You, you, God is not real till we talk back to him. I mean, our response to him is one thing that makes to us the reality of God a reality. Amen. And just recognize now that you belong to Christ and you say you work, he lives in you, there's not a thing you do. You can't even jump off your back porch without being a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do in word or in deed, the devil invented the telephone to destroy the church. Very possibly, when you look at what happens, the way people talk up dissatisfaction, opposition to the church or to the leaders or something, let's use every word as a representative of Jesus Christ. People say, what do you mean in the name of Jesus Christ? Not, not saying that, but my son Ben got to working for 
Goodman Church Builders, and uh, besides doing some business drawings in the blueprints and so forth, he was sent on missions to get subcontractors and so forth, sign such things not with his money, he was just in the name of Goodman Church Builders. Now he's working down at Connor Crawfordsville with Chuck Akers, and the, I think the, the, the company that built this building, right? And they're building a lot of buildings around. I stopped down there a couple of months ago in, in their office and looked at things like that. <clears throat> Do you realize that you are doing the Lord's business? Your bank account is his bank account. You never write a red check that is not approved by Jesus Christ. Which use this June, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> All right. You've sufficiently scared me with it, too. <laughs> Just a, a little bit in response to uh, Sister Juanita there. It, scripture tells us to be ready always to give an answer for the hope that lies in us. And that has very much to do with what we have spoken about today, as far as the fruit of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. And that is, one of the things is that we'll have this hope. Now, I can testify to this. If you live and allow the hope that is in you to be discovered by other people, if you have that hope, there'll be people come up and ask you what you're so, so glad about, why you're not despairing, why you talk like you do, why you don't talk like they do. They'll, they'll want to know these things, and that's part of the fruit. It, some of the fruit is we have a desire to go out and the other part is we shine as lights in the darkness Amen. and those it, it, it's a beacon for those that would see Amen. Amen. I love all the agricultural uh, language and pictures that we read in the scripture and many of you have used the same illustrations uh, that we read but I thought uh, just now that it's not actually agricultural language is kingdom language this is how God talks he talks about planting seed he talks about soil he talks about trees he talks about vines he talks about the olive tree and the the, the root of the tree this is how God has, has cultured his people in talking to his people and so in thinking about this seed that's been sown it says the son of man sows the seed that's the beginning and in the same parable, he says the angels are the reapers. Mm -hmm. So it takes you from the beginning to the end. The angels are going to reap. But in the middle of this process, from the initiation to the culmination of this process, the Spirit's the cultivator. And uh, to the Thessalonians, it says that you receive the Word of God, 
not as it is the word of man, but as it actually is, in truth, the word of God, which effectually works within you. When the word of God does not work, that means that it wasn't received as the word of God. When it's received as the word of God, that's, that's when it's good soil without encumbersomes. There's no, there's no rocks in the soil, and it's, there, it's got good deep soil. The birds aren't, are, are kept away from it when it's received as the Word of God. But I tend to think in, uh, in terms of cause and effect. I like to know why God did this, and I, I want to know what to, to what end did God do this. Why did God sow this seed? And uh, it's because of love. Without love, the, the apostle said, I am nothing. Even though... I have all faith and can remove mountains, yet without love it profiteth me nothing. So this is a very serious, very serious point. Love validates everything that you do. You can do a lot for God, but without love it doesn't mean anything. And so, see, love is superior to obligation. Love is superior to intellect. Love is superior to, to anything else, even faith and hope, because love shall never fail. Love should, see, somebody loves the truth, and you can trust. You can trust that person with what they say, with what they do, with how they act, with their lives, with their family, with their finances, with people. You can trust somebody that loves the truth, because love never fails. I, like, I love to think of... Uh, the account of Moses in Hebrews 11. It says that um, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. God, in, in saying that, he, he just leaped over the top of this. In refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he refused the heir of the throne, which was the world power. So he refused worldly uh, royalty, is what, is what this involves refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It goes on, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Mm -hmm. Choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now this choice was not according to wisdom as far as Egypt was concerned. Uh, he, was, he was learned in all the, the uh, learnings of Egypt. So somebody taught Moses of the, the wisdom of Egypt. So this looked absurd to these people that imparted their uh, carnal and, and worldly wisdom to Moses because he rejected that and chose affliction. Why did he do this? Well, he tells us, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Amen. And that's a prophetic way of saying that he loved what God has more than what the world has. Amen. 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 This gets pretty good. There, Brother D. I have one more comment on the matter of. Uh, uh, Memorizing scripture, and Brother Seth mentioned there that it's hard to get people to memorize. Well, I think it's an essential thing, mainly because you, when you're when you're. Uh, Memorizing scripture, you're imbibing scripture, you're eating scripture, you're imbibing Christ. That's what you're doing. You're imbibing Christ. If, if, if this would get through to people, that, that's, that's how you have Christ. You, you, you take him. You're internal. It, it, Christ is internalized within you that way by the, by the scripture. And um, it's, it's a valuable, valuable thing. I can attest to that. That's, that's the only way you'll have any measure of victory the way I understand it, that's the only way I've ever had any measure of victory. So uh, I just would would uh, uh, make that comment. Uh, well, that just made me think that the see the Spirit works through the Word. So you want the Spirit to work in you, and you come to any given situation. Or maybe someone, you want to minister someone who needs to hear the Word of God. Well, the Spirit begins to survey 
your inventory of Bible knowledge. <laughs> and he's going, let me, let me see what I can work with here. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of sparse, but he pulls up things, doesn't he? That you thought you've forgotten. But that's how the Spirit works. He works with what you've hidden in your heart. That's right. It's a holding pattern. I, I was, I, I thought, well, no, I'm not going to say anything. I've already said all I had to say. But when Brother Aaron said that about Moses, well, I kept thinking the whole time everyone was speaking, maybe somebody else will say it. Lord, let somebody else say it, because they'll say it better than me. But, but nobody else said it. Uh, I was thinking um, uh, just in general about the whole three days, you know, and the different things that people remember, and I don't re always remember which speaker said it, but remember the one that said they stood up, an exceeding great army, and when we came up, we came up with our arm armor on because we come up for a fight. Well, I found it to be so. I come up for a fight. I didn't always know that, and I thought there was something wrong with me, but I know now that I, that I come up with my armor on. And I, I wanted to say, I was just going to read it because I can read it better than I can say it. Um, I, I can't say anything, and I'm not going to say anything, that these godly men have already opened so much about the Holy Spirit. But this thought wouldn't leave me alone. And um, there was many things that the brethren said just like that about the armor. Just little, little thoughts here and there, scattered. But I wanted to just mention two. One of them um, was several people said that about the Holy Spirit being like a helper, and he comes up alongside you. Well, they used a fancy word that I couldn't remember, but that's okay. Because the important thing is that he's there. He comes up. He's beside you. That's the important thing. And I was thinking about maybe, of course, being a woman, I think more of the ladies. But I think, you know, young, young girls, they don't have a mate. You know, some of the other middle-aged ladies, maybe they, um, maybe they're lost their mates. And some of the widows, of course, older ladies that are widows, have truly lost their mates to death. But he's there beside of us, you know. And we, he, he'll be everything we need if we'll let him. But we have to let him. He wants to be, he wants to be our helper, but we have to let him be our helper. So that, that blessed me. And another thought blessed me. He said, um, uh, see, you, even if you have a mate, he's got to go to work sometime or you're not going to eat. But see, the Holy Spirit, he, he'll be there all the time if you let him. He said, I'll, the Lord said, I'll never leave you and I'll never Amen. forsake you. So see, anytime we need him, he's there. Can't always count on an earthly mate to be there, but, or anybody else for that matter. But the Holy Spirit, we can. And I, and I like that thought about him coming alongside of us. And, um, and then I was thinking about this treasure. Several times it's been said that we have a treasure. It, it isn't an earthen vessel. And I do understand what he means about the earthen vessel. It's, it's of the earth earthy, and I understand that. But you know what? What if it was a treasure in an iron vessel? You wouldn't break that iron vessel very easy, would you? But in an earthen vessel, it can be broken. And as I was thinking about the treasure, I thought, oh, Lord, if we'll break the vessel for you and let the, let the treasure spill out and let you use the treasure. It's your treasure. Let you use it in any way that you can use it to glorify you, you know, to, to glorify your kingdom, to help others. It's a treasure, brother, and it wasn't ours until he gave it to us. And I thought about the lady who broke the alabaster box. Remember her? And some thought it was wasted, but it wasn't wasted. Jesus said in Mark 14, 8, anywhere the gospel was preached, he set up a memorial for her. She didn't waste, she didn't waste her treasure. It was a treasure to her, probably very costly, but it was hers. This treasure that we have in this earthen vessel, God gave us. We didn't get it on our own. He gave it to us. I mean, maybe we should break, break the vessel and let him use the treasure for his glory. Amen. Amen. As Sister Becky comes up, I was thinking how Christ there took the entire Old Covenant requirements and distilled it down to a single sentence. Here's, here is succinct. All the law, 
all the law simply stated to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and add strength, and your neighbor is yourself. All, all, all of Moses, all the prophets, that, there it is, right there, distilled into that simple thing. That's, and the Spirit uses, uses these things. We're talking about the employ, how the Spirit employs the Scripture in all of this, in, in this application here. And Sister Becky, go right ahead. Well, first, I'd like to say, if you stand right here, they can hear you back there. Uh, some of us are having trouble when they stand over here. Is that all right? <laughs> now, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Everyone that is here and has been here these days didn't come with empty cups. I know that because I've listened to them. But they did come for the refreshing and the renewing that no matter how much you think you have, there's more. Amen. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So had we deprived ourselves of being here this day, we would not have received from God that which he has given us because we are here. So I'm thankful for that. I can see how enlarged each one of us have been just by our talking one to the other. It has been good to speak to each one after these sessions and know that God has honored this word by the Holy Spirit because we was able to receive it and rejoice in it. And it's a way of thanksgiving to God because he didn't withhold. We came expecting. He has not withheld. This year, as every year, just seems to escalate more and more because as we started out and the hunger and the thirst grew, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He will not disappoint you. The other thing I want to give thanks for is these young men. Now, in our day and age, for quite some time even, young men standing at the pulpit was an unheard of thing. That older men had all the wisdom, and they didn't want to give up that position. But thank God we had men of vision to see how to raise these young men up. Now, they operate by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And we have witnessed this, this this week because of men who who have taught them the truth. They have taken hold of it and they can run with it. And we can benefit by that because even if we didn't participate in the teaching, our prayers were important that God would raise them up. We've asked him to do that. He's done it. Thank the Lord. We need we need these young people to to carry on. And while the others are still here, to be assisted. We always need each other. And that's why we come together. It's so we can be fresh, refreshed and nourished and grow. And for me to say that revival hadn't been in me would be kind of absurd. And I think with everyone here, we have been revived. And it can begin in us, and it will only begin in others if they have this hunger and thirst for these things that we have been partaking of. It's wonderful to be able to thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Brethren, we are both used up a lot of time here. This, we could go on for a long time. Chuck Barron, one minute. Would you really in one minute? All right. Brother Chuck. It's a pleasure to have you, brother. You go right ahead. One minute. I'm Chuck Marion from Wabash. Uh, you do hear earlier, we're uh, repetitiveness. We have to... Usually you have that to yeah. lot, do a lot of learning. And I would, I'll get into that a little bit. But, but we look at Peter. We hear a lot about Peter. And uh, he was actually a doer. He jumped out a little bit quick and everything. He also uh, heard from the Lord Jesus where he said, uh, you know, you will deny me mm -hmm. three times before you hear that cock crow. And that was reality hit when he when Peter heard heard that cock crow, and uh, but afterwards he did not, you know, he whipped bitterly, but yet Jesus came to him and reminded him. But see repetitiveness again. Feed my sheep. Yes. Feed my sheep. Yes. Feed my sheep. That isn't what I come up here for, but uh, it was. What I wanted to talk about is uh, the comforter, being repetitive that, you know, we've heard the comforter. 
a lot here. But uh, it is written here in four, uh, John 14. Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall uh, give you another comforter, that he might, may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it's, it, it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, and for he dwells with you, and shall uh, be with you. you know, and so, I have to use this uh, scripture right here for myself. Oh, amen. Uh, there's been some little bit of trials and tribulations that come upon me, so I can see how Peter felt. You know, and uh, but God, you know, Jesus sent, said He'd send a Comforter, and that that same Comforter called me out of the world to come to know uh, Christ and now at, at times that I need him I am comforted in the spirit for, for tough times Amen. but also we see here as far as memory this is uh, in 26 but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring thing, all things to re, your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So this is where, and when we put that in our hearts, that the Spirit can reach in that well and bring it back to remembrance for that time of need where we do have to, to say where our hope is from, where it comes from. Amen. 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 There, you know, there are there are times, and there are, there are some brethren like when Paul talked. He had been in the perils of the deep. He knew about some of those things. You know, James A. Garfield stood at this pulpit. Later on, he was shot and assassinated. Brother Brother Chuck's been through some areas where he was shot through the heart. He buried his own son. I mean, there's the, we got brethren here that have been through the fires. We have, and yet because of the Comforter, the Comforter, brother. I appreciate your ministry. Thank you. Thank you for your faith. Yes, I appreciate the caliber of our brethren gathered here. One more thing about hearing now. We're going to have to wind this up. This is, again, now this is the Spirit's employment of Scripture. And if He speaks so precisely, so straight to the point and so quietly, listen to, I just want to go through these real quick. Revelations 2.7 He that hath an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. That is a thunderclap. Right? To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What a promise for those that hear. A couple verses later. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Brethren, he is not using that same typeset over and over again because it's easy to write. He's laying out for you something that's extremely important. Listen to this. Here, here are the promises of God embedded in quick succession in the book of the Revelation. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Second time, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. This is important to us. He created the stars also. Again, just a few verses later, he that hath an ear to hear, is he saying this again? Yes, he wants us to hear this. What the Spirit saith to the churches, to him that overcometh I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. What's your name? Legion, for we are many. No names? Each one of these get a white stone with their name written in it. Those things that he loved in the creation, I calleth them by name. Created the stars also. Again, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. He that hath an ear to hear. 
let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Sister, about your profession, your confession right here. Hold it fast. Sometimes that's all you could say is, yes, I've been baptized, I believe. Sometimes things aren't as clear as others. Hold it fast. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And this goes on several other times. Let me do what Jesse did. I want to end on this one, though. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Brother Michael.